Okay, people, let's get started. Um, again, the midterm is two and a half weeks off. Um, the last class for the midterm will be, um, that's on the midterm, will be two weeks from today. Um, I uh, will see how far I get, right? I built a little padding into the schedule because um, um, every year I seem to add stuff to these lectures and, and not take as much away as I should. So I'll probably end up slipping a full lecture at some point. And, and if you look later in the schedule, there are multiple days where there's one, two, and three of the same topic, and I'll condense, condense it there. But that means that next Friday we may or may not get through water. All right, and the important point is that don't look for water questions on the exam if we don't get all the way to the take home messages on water, okay? That's the important point. Anything that I don't finish isn't on the exam by two weeks from today, all right? I'll, I'll reemphasize that, but there's also a review two weeks from today. The way the review works is it's not really review. What we do is we, uh, the instructors are all here uh, I think it's here, or it's wherever it is that's that's publicized, and for um, a couple of hours or more, we'll just answer, well, you ask questions, right? Go through stuff that you don't understand, ask questions, and uh, we'll try to get other students to answer them, and failing that, we'll go over it again, okay? So that's the way that works, and we'll do that until you're done. But that'll be the only, the only review session, and it's, you know, it's the week before, before the exam, so do be aware that that, that is coming up. And what's worthwhile is to run through the what you need to know stuff in my lectures, at least, before you get there. All right, the stuff at the end. All right, so we were talking about methane because methane is the second most important greenhouse gas. And remember, methane has a short lifetime, but it's much more reactive as a greenhouse agent than CO2, uh, but it's short-lived in the atmosphere. Um, and there is a methodology um, that is used to um, set policies on uh, greenhouse gases that says, for instance, how bad methane is relative to CO2. And I want to teach you what that, what that policy is. It's a thing called the global warming potential. Um, I'm never going to ask you to compute one, but I want you to understand what the idea is. And the important take home here is that uh, this is a convention that was developed when the idea was to start taking account of greenhouse emissions and to start doing something about them. And it's what you do if there's going to be a transient um, forever increase and you want to slow it. The metric that we ought to be using is one about steady state. It's about end game, all right? How important are residual methane emissions once we've reached the end? What are we shooting for? And there is no metric and the one that exists and is enshrined in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and reaffirmed in, in uh, uh, Paris, and that will probably be amended in the in the COP26, um, which, is, which is ongoing, right? Um, is is uh, is something else. Anyway, methane is a greenhouse gas that actually has a lot of sources. All right, so so the one you may be familiar with is fossil fuels. You can see that fossil fuels are something like a quarter of the methane emissions. And the methane from fossil fuels comes from two sources. The first is natural gas is itself almost entirely methane. And so if natural gas leaks out when you're trying to produce it, when you're drilling a well or when you're pumping it out of the ground and you're moving it through all kinds of pipes, if some joints are loose, for instance, then um, natural gas leaks into the atmosphere. Beyond that, um, before we cared about greenhouse gases, the oil and gas industry put all kinds of kit out in the boondocks where there was no electricity that actually ran on compressed methane and vents it to the atmosphere. So that some of the pumps that you see working across the West are actually run by methane coming out of the ground making that 
thing go up and down and they vent it to the atmosphere, okay? So in the United States, we lose a little over 2% of the gross methane produced to the atmosphere, which turns out to be a pretty big deal for something 100 times more reactive than CO2, right? And so the other big source, um, so, so that's natural gas production. Turns out that um, oil and natural gas often occur together. And in places where there isn't a gas pipeline, but there is an oil well, which are all kinds of places around the world. North Dakota, the huge Baku field is that way. Uh, off the coast of West Africa, all the big offshore oil uh, field is that way. There's no way to get rid of the gas. It is so-called stranded. And so what they have historically done is to just vent the gas that comes out of an oil well into the atmosphere. And then increasingly, they flare it. All right. Now, when you flare it, one of the reasons you do that, if it's a lot coming out, is because the stuff will blow up and kill everybody, right? But when you flare it, the flare has incomplete combustion. And so if a lot of it comes out, some of the, some of the gas still goes uh, to the atmosphere. And if you go to your house, like at home house, you, a lot of you will have a natural gas uh, water heater. And I bet you bucks that if you look at it, like a third of you will see that the flame is kind of blue, not yellow. And that means that you're venting natural gas to the atmosphere, right? That's what that means. And so in any case, um, so, so, so natural gas emissions from fossil fuels also come from oil. And finally, coal contains a huge amount of methane. That's the mine gas that you were so worried about with the canary in the coal mine and stuff like that, right? And that's, you know, the miner's light would set off the mine gas and blow everybody up, that's methane. And so all three fossil fuels um, emit methane to the atmosphere. And, you know, that's a problem. Uh, it turns out though, that this is probably the easiest uh, source to get rid of because you've got a valuable product that's being wasted. Um, it's, um, explosive, so it's a risk to the workers and the industry and the kit that you're dealing with. And it's got environmental and reputational damage. And so the big gas companies, the big technology heavy ones with lots of capital, want to do something about it and have voluntarily proposed really stringent caps that would basically take that source away. And it's the little producers that don't have the capital that, that fight it. Another source is biomass burning, um, uh, and another source is domestic ruminants. Um, you know, famously, cattle are, are supposed to fart methane, but they don't, they actually burp it, okay? And they have anaerobic digesters in their uh, multi-chambered stomachs, and so they burp a bunch of methane. Um, rice cultivation emits methane, it emits it because Rice cultivation occurs in a swamp, right? Rice is a swamp plant, and the swamp can get stinky, and when it gets stinky, it's anoxic on the bottom. And when there is, in the presence of no oxygen, um, there's a group of bacteria that will um, uh, emit methane, all right? And they'll, they'll consume hydro, uh, like sugars and turn it into methane. Um, this is thought methanogens and meth methane eating is, is, um, is uh, this is one of the reasons why NASA is so excited whenever they detect methane in the atmosphere of Mars, right? Possibility that there's a, there's an oxygenless biosphere still remnant in the crust in Mars that is uh, emitting methane. And finally, there's waste decomposition for the same reason, right? We've got a bunch of trash and some of it goes anoxic and a big pile of garbage and methane comes out. And that's why if you um, go past huge trash piles, old trash piles, like in the Meadowlands on the way from here to New York along the Jersey Turnpike, you'll see that there are installations that look like little towers. And those are actually methane collectors. Trash, uh, uh, big landfill cell methane that comes out of it. And so all these are sources, and collectively it's a lot of stuff, right? It's a pretty big source, it's second to CO2. So the question is, one of the questions that you'll see out there is that natural gas is better for the 
climate than coal. And indeed, Senator Manchin is pushing right now for to weaken the climate bill so that um, producers don't just get paid to get rid of fossil CO2 emissions altogether or almost altogether. They also get, ba get paid for, for shifting from burning coal to burning gas in a power plant. And that's because um, coal is almost 100% carbon. You can think of it as like pure carbon, right? In fact, if you put coal under a lot of pressure, it will turn into a diamond, okay? And, and so when you burn coal and turn it into CO2, you're burning only carbon, and all of the energy is, is producing CO2 molecules. Methane is CH4, all right? It's the highest number of hydrogens possible for each carbon in a hydrocarbon, in any fossil fuel. So that when you burn methane, the O's go to the C, and you get CO2 like, it, like what happens when you burn coal, but the O's also go on the H's and make water vapor. You burn the hydrogen in the methane. And so a lot of the energy that the methane is producing actually comes from burning the hydrogen stuck on the methane, right? And that means that you get roughly double the energy per CO2 molecule produced from the combustion that you would from coal. Just as simple as that, all right? And so, um, so, so the gas industry constantly says, oh, this is the best greenhouse gas solution. But the problem is that um, CH4, a lot of it is emitted during the production of natural gas more than is emitted during the production of CO2. And not very much has to be emitted, like 3% before the natural gas is at least temporarily worse than the coal, right? Even though, even though the coal is emitting more CO2, the natural gas is causing more methane emissions to the atmosphere. But it's kind of apples and oranges because the coal CO2, you know, the extra CO2 from the coal is going to stay in the atmosphere for hundreds or thousands of years, and the methane has this 10-year half-life. So what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Well, we need some way to regulate it. And this is what was come up with um, before you were born, and it probably isn't so um, uh, useful anymore, but it's still what is in the international law and the national law and everything else. So I'm going to tell you what it is. Um, so the idea is, in a, in a model, a simple model, it's pretty simple, you emit a pulse of methane, like a kilogram. Now, it turns out that the model of the fate of that methane is extremely simple. And you don't need to know this. You're never going to need to regurgitate this on a test. But if you're a scientist or an engineer or otherwise sort of math jock, it's simply an exponential decay with a 12-year half-life. It's e to the minus time over 12, the end. That's what happens to it. It decays away exponentially. And initially, when it's first put out there, this 120 means it has 120 times the radiative forcing of the same mass of CO2. So if it's a kilometer of methane, it's 120 times worth. Just so I put it out there as a, as, a, as, a, as a kilogram of CO2. But then it decays away through time, and that's an e-fold, that's, that's an exponential decay with a 12-year. Uh, e folding. That's e to the minus t over 12. Okay? And so the area under this curve is sort of the total amount of warming you get out of that pulse for some number of years up to a time horizon. The curve on the bottom is the same curve. You can't even see it because it's what you would get from the radiative forcing of one kilogram of CO2 put out there. It starts out much lower, but it's gonna last a lot longer, all right? And what you literally do is take the area under the light blue curve and divide it by the area under the dark blue curve, and the area is up to some time horizon, which in international law is currently 100 years. And that quantity is called the global warming potential of methane or any other gas. So, so you take the area under the curve like this, the radiative forcing of the gas relative to CO2, 
over the radiative forcing, which is the area under the curve for CO2, same mass up to a particular time. That's what it is. All right. Now you can see probably that it's going to depend on how, how long the time over which you are calculating the area of the curve for. I mean, if you do it for just a little tiny bit, there's just like giant amount of methane here, a teeny weeny amount of CO2, so that the effect, so that that ratio is going to be gigantic. If you do it for a really, really long time, like a thousand years, the methane is long gone. All right, 95% of the methane is gone after 36 years. The CO2 is still hanging around. Okay, and so then the global warming potential of methane is going to be tiny relative to the area under the CO2 curve, and it's going to be close to zero. So it's ar utterly arbitrary from a scientific standpoint, but of course it's absolutely full of meaning from an ethical standpoint has huge implications for the profitability of different kinds of businesses. So it's hotly contested on a whole bunch of self-interested grounds, none of which are scientific, OK? So when you look at that ratio as a function of the time horizon, the, the amount of time over which you calculate the area under the curve for methane, divided by the area under the curve over the same time horizon for CO2, it looks like this. It starts out at 120. By the time it gets to um, 20 years, it's about 86. And by the time you get to 100 years, it's 34, all right? So 34 times worse than CO2. You see, if you used 100 years and you were saying, well, I have to pay, I don't know, $100 a ton for CO2 emissions, how much would I have to pay for methane emissions? Well, if you use 86, you have to pay $8,600 for the same mass of methane emissions. If you use 100 years, you only have to pay 3,400 bucks, right? So there's 1,500, 200 bucks different. And that's why it's, people fight over it. But the real issues besides those are ethical. So who are we worried about and when, right? That's what the story is. And the whole point is, though, that this is, this is based on the idea of emitting a pulse. And then you're worried about how much extra warming downstream is going to happen. Whereas what we're, the future we're facing is one in which we tamp emissions all the way down as low as possible, like methane emissions, and the rest have to be offset by CO2 somehow so that they cancel through time, so that we don't add any more warming to the planet, period. And that would require a whole different methodology that doesn't exist and isn't going to be because there's vested interest in keeping this going. So this is a global warming potential. So if you were an anti-fracking activist, OK, which time horizon would you use to argue that gas is as bad or worse than coal? OK, so you're wanting to say, it's all those methane emissions from gas are really bad. And it's worse than coal. It's not better than coal. Senator Manchin is just trying to keep some kind of story going in his state. He's out for the gas. There, there are only 13,000 coal workers left in West Virginia, but there's like zillions of gas workers. All right, and so, so that's the story there. So which of these, let me click this little unit. Oh, green? Green, green. Select. <laughs> I'm obviously challenged. OK, <laughs> there you go. Click it as fast as you can, because, you know. OK, five seconds. Click, click, click. <laughs> this is pretty good, actually. All right, so click the results now. Yeah. And the answer is B. Um, what were the choices again? I can't remember. Yeah, zero years, 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years. I'd use zero years. The shorter you make it, the worse the gas looks, or the, the worse the gas looks, OK? So A was the right answer, um, uh, and uh, D is the worst answer. And it's because methane decays out of the atmosphere. So if you look at the total warming it causes, the longer the time horizon is, the worse methane looks relative to coal, 
relative to CO2 when coal is emitting the CO2 more than the gas is, right? So, so you want it to be short. And indeed, anytime you, you hear environmentalists that are arguing that methane needs to be regulated more tightly, they'll use a 20-year global warming potential, not 100 years. And those are the two kind of conventions that have slipped into use in scientific papers, even though 100 years is the national and international um, legal standard, okay? So that's what's going on there. All right. Oops. Do not end. <laughs> Which I can. The blue cloud again. There we go. All right. All right. And there's one other <clears throat> term that's used um, for this that you'll see in a lot of the graphs of like anthropogenic emissions. They won't be just CO2, they'll be CO2 eek, right? CO2 with a little eek. And that means equivalent. And that means they're summing up not just CO2, but all the other greenhouse gases. And they're putting them in so-called CO2 equivalent terms. And the CO2 equivalent of a non-CO2 greenhouse gas or aerosol emission, anything, equals the CO2 emission that would cause the same radiative forcing over a time horizon. So the ones you always see out there are using a 100-year global warming potential. And thus, the CO2 eek for one kilogram of methane emissions is 34 kilograms, because the global warming potential of methane at 100 years is 34, all right? So that's what that thing is. If you see CO2 eek, they've added up not just the CO2 emissions, but all of the other emissions using this sort of terminology, right, and technology. Okay, I want to talk about a bunch of climate change impacts and um, then switch to the, the one that's really, that's at the end of this list, extreme weather, which is the one that's really grabbed the media uh, lately for good reason. And there are tons of these. I mean, there's just such a gigantic literature. It's a rogues gallery of impacts at this point. There are thousands of people, you know, that measure this stuff all the time. And so I've got on the list temperature, biodiversity, precipitation, sea level rise, crop yield, ocean productivity, wildfire, and extreme weather. Um, this is the, um, the main graph, set of graphs of impacts from the um, uh, IPCC AR6 that just came out. Um, uh, these are the global surface temperatures, again, from the different emission scenarios. We talked about that last time. So this actually shows what it does, the difference between them in 2100 for Arctic sea ice area. And what you'll notice is that um, Arctic sea ice is um, um, effectively zero. Uh, in the upper scenarios. And it's only in the two scenarios that keep us under two degrees that you get substantial Arctic sea ice at the end, stabilization of Arctic sea ice. O otherwise, it just goes away, okay? And that's, you know, it, like, and so what do you lose then? Well, you lose quite a bit. You lose some things that people care about, mostly for aesthetic reasons. So you almost certainly lose polar bears because polar bears hunt from sea ice. And without that, they have to live on land, and they interbreed with grizzly bears, and they'll just be, um, you know, they'll go extinct in a, <laughs> in a frenzy of interbreeding. Um, there are also all kinds of other vertebrates that depend on the ice sea interface to hunt. You know, there's seals that do that, and there are all kinds of birds that do that. And they'll also be gone. And of course, the Inuit, who depend on sea ice, will, will uh, um, no longer be able to practice their historic uh, lifestyles. Uh, global surface pH um, goes down because the seas become more acidic, and that harms corals and other things. has all kinds of implications that we don't fully understand at all. And global mean sea level change in 2100. You see is about half a meter higher in the worst case than in the... Um, in the best case, the worst case being <clears throat> uh, four degrees of change, roughly. Um, well, four degrees uh, long term, but well, you can see it here, right? Four degrees versus 
a degree and a half or two degrees. But the important thing is to look over here and to say, what's the uncertainty on these estimates? And the point is, we don't know very much about sea level. We know a lot about sea level rise, the thermal expansion of water, and the historical rate of sea level rise. But it turns out that continents deglaciate, not that way. It's like something gets started, and there's the potential for them to de deglaciate really quickly, all right? We can talk about what some of those mechanisms are. I'll just give you one idea. Um, what happens is the ice is so heavy that it pushes the land down. At the edge of Antarctica, a lot of the land is actually below the sea level under the glaciers. And when the ice is, is melted off, the land rebounds for centuries, gets taller and taller and taller. But right now, it's stuck way down there, which means there's a lip that comes up to sea level at the end, right? As it's been rebounding, right? Now, that keeps the thing sort of stuck, right? And doesn't want it to slide off into the sea. But when it starts to melt, cracks form in it, and you get like rivers that pour into the great big crevasses in these continental glaciers. You probably see that in like a nature show somewhere, right? These big rivers going into the glacier. And they lubricate the bottom and make it easy for that thing to slide off into the sea. And so there's the potential that we would lose one of these ice sheets, and that would be bad, like capital B bad, like, like all the major coastal cities of the world would have to be abandoned, right? That'd be bad, 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 bad. And so what's the, what's the uncertainty in this scenario? Well, we don't know if in 2100 it's going to be two meters or seven meters. Seven meters is a bad number, OK? Two meters is a pretty bad number. Even for the scenarios that mean solving the climate problem, we risk a three meter change. That's dikeable in a New York City, but, but it's a big, big construction project and you have to have, do it all over the entire world, right? And all of the vacation houses, forget about it, all right? All right, so, this is also IPCC AR6. Um, what it just shows, the only thing it's showing, is um, this is the temperature distribution for 1.5 degrees of warming, 2 and 4 degrees of warming. The important thing is to look at the distribution. The, these numbers mask the fact that most of the warming occurs, first of all, over land where we live, and secondly, in the north and, and far south, much more than in the middle, OK? So that's one thing. Uh, this one just shows that um, because um, warm air holds more water vapor than cold air under warming, you end up with higher total precipitation. That is, this is a precipitation change for one and a half degrees of change, two degrees, and four degrees. The blue colors indicate increases. The other colors indicate decreases. There's more blue than there are yellows and ambers. but. The important thing to see is that what are the areas that get decreased precipitation? Because those are the areas that suffer. Increased precipitation, well, it's kind of soggy out, but you can still do agriculture. Agriculture might even get better. And where it's kind of worst is in big areas of the tropics, and then in some other areas like the Mediterranean and the Middle East that are already dry, all right? So the general rule is that dry areas get drier and wet areas get wetter. This one down here is a more important measure of drought. This is how much the total column soil moisture, average soil moisture, is going to change. So again, the amount of water in the soil is what plants care about, right? And the amount of water in the soil doesn't depend just on how much water flows into it from precipitation, but how much leaves from evaporation. And so if the amount of water going into the soil stays the same, but it gets hotter, so more evaporates, then the, the soil gets drier, and the plant can experience drought. And so what this shows, in contrast to this, is much more clearly what happens to the American Midwest and West, all right? That you get soil drought in the American Midwest and West, and also you get horrific soil drought in the Amazon, 
okay, under these, under these high warming scenarios. So, so loss of water for agriculture and ecosystems is a big problem in the future. Even if we put it under control, we still get a lot of this, you see? A lot of drought in the breadbasket and in the American West, and a lot of drought in the Amazon, and drought in Southern Africa, and big drought in the Middle East, where there's already trouble, and drought in some of the breadbaskets in Southeast Asia because the monsoon gets affected, um, some drought in Australia. And so, so those areas are actually problematic. But then there are other areas, like um, uh, uh, the Sahel, that get, that get substantially wetter, right? Life gets better there, right, than it is now. Um, this is a very complicated graph. This is also the IPCC AR6, and what it shows is a climatological um, uh, uh, a story about the frequency of hot extremes. So what this shows is that in the present, where there's been one degree of climate change, right now, an event that was so hot, a day that was so hot that it occurred only once in 10 years. It was the hottest day on average in 10 years here in New Jersey. That would have been like, you know, back in 1850 to 1900. So for here, it might have been 98 degrees or something. How much more common is that day, that 98 degree day now than it was back then where it occurred once every 10, 10 years? And the answer is it's 2.8 times more common already. And as it gets hotter and hotter, it becomes more and more common, you see here. Now, I only want you to notice two things from this graph. Um, uh, the first is that if we compare a 10-year event with one significantly more extreme, a 50-year event, so hot it occurs once in 50 years, 1850 to 1900, you'll see that it's 4.8 times more likely now than it was back then. And that number, the acceleration of the most extreme extremes, is bigger than the acceleration of the less extreme extremes. And that's going to be a recurring theme on this extreme weather thing. The extreme weather, for the worst things, gets accelerated more and more and more and more. So a lot of the extremes we're experiencing already are a thousand or more times more common than they were just 50 years ago. And that's why the weather seems to have gone crazy all of a sudden. It's because these really rare things, things that are outside human um, experience, all of a sudden just start happening because they happen so much more frequently. And even though they're still pretty rare, there's so many places in the world that there's always like one happening, right? Same thing is true of heavy precipitation. You'll see 1.3 times now for a 10-year event and 1.7 times for, a, uh, for ag uh, agriculture and ecological drought. So, so, um, so that's the story there. We'll revisit that later. Um, there are some things that are, that, are, that are mostly due to global warming already. So coastal flooding in the United States, two-thirds of coastal floods in the United States are already human-caused because of the sea level rise to date. Um, this is just a picture of what the expected sea level rise is with four degrees of change. That's the Wall Street Bowl <laughs> before and after. And so that's the, that's the normal sea level if we had four degrees of climate change. Um, this is what I said before that uh, uh, ice sheet loss would be bad. We lost the Greenland ice sheet. Seas would rise quickly by seven meters. If we lost the West Antarctic ice sheet, by five meters, about 16 feet, 17 feet, something like that. And if we lost the East Antarctic ice sheet by 60 meters, 60 meters is of course a very large number. We're not likely to lose the East Antarctic ice sheet anytime soon. But um, the West Antarctic ice sheet is already showing considerable signs of being uh, unstable, all right? And, and you know, pieces the size of Massachusetts are breaking off of it. So this one's actually worrisome, right? And we don't, again, this is still, this is the age where we're trying to understand continental glaciation and deglaciation well, and we actually don't have good scientific understanding. We have enough scientific understanding to know 
that there are all kinds of mechanisms that should make it happen fast that we don't understand. And there are also paleo records that show that it did happen fast in the future, in the past sometimes, but we don't completely know why. So this is one of those monsters behind the door that makes um, climate scientists more sort of skittish about this subject than the general public. Um, this is just a, I actually don't know how important this is, but it's a, it's a clever idea. Um, it turns out that you can me estimate how fast trees can move, like how far their seeds go, then they have to grow up again, and then how far their seeds go. So how fast can the range of a tree expand, tree species? And the same sort of thing for herbaceous plants and rodents and monkeys and stuff like that. And if you think about um, uh, global climate change, um, species are bounded by weather and climate extremes already. So they exist within a weather envelope. So a lot of tree species, for instance, are their northern boundary is determined by the frost line, for example. Right? And as the frost line moves north, so too will those species move north. Right? And, and the southern and dry boundaries, all of them, have climatological determinants. And so under the different global warming scenarios, you can estimate how fast the range boundaries, climatological range boundaries of a species will move, right, as the planet's warming. Because the, for instance, the, let's suppose that you're an alpine dependent mammal like a pika, all right? And you live on the top of a mountain in Colorado. And what's happening is your low altitude range boundary is moving up the mountain. How fast does it move relative to how fast you can disperse? Well, it turns out in that case, it doesn't really matter because if, what matters if, is if it pops off the top of the mountain and then you're dead no matter how fast you can move. But on continents, it, th th this shows the velocity of the climate change relative to the velocity of species movement, and some of these species are going to get overrun. That's the important point. And so to keep them going, you'd have to move them around. Right? You, they, they couldn't do it on their own. Uh, these are yield changes. A lot of our crops in the tropics are, are, are going to experience um, yield declines. Some crops in some places will experience yield increases, but they're big places where high temperatures already really hurt um, crops. A lot of the yield loss in U.S. corn, for instance, and soybeans is caused by heat events, which are increasing. Um, the primary productin, production of the uh, plankton in our oceans how much photosynthetic energy all the algae in the world take up and make available to all the fisheries of the world is changing as the planet warms. And we don't understand what this is going to do. All right. So this is just kind of worrying because like the oceans are big and oceanic ecosystems are complicated. And this is the primary engine of those oceanic ecosystems that supplies all of the food for all of the fish and everything that lives in the sea. And they're pretty good sized changes. Um, that are geographically distributed and big losses, for instance, in tropical oceans. So what's that going to do? I don't know. Big losses in the North Atlantic. I don't know what it's going to do. Um, some of the things you do know what's going to do, these are the um, expected increases in the range of malaria. All right, you already see the vectors of malaria in Princeton now. If you'd come as a student here, even 15 years ago, I don't know if you noticed when you first got here, if you sit outside, sometimes there'll be teeny weeny little mosquitoes sneaking around. They're sneaky little things. Sneak around the floor and they sneak up and then bite you on the leg and they have stripes on them, black and white stripes. And those are actually malarial mosquitoes and they're from the tropics, right? And they, they die out in the winter, but they come up in the summer. And so it's only a matter of time, right, before the malaria starts to creep up into the U.S. despite control measures. It used to be here, but it was seasonal, and it's likely to become endemic. Uh, increased wildfire risk per degree warming is gigantic. We see that all the time. All right, they had to wrap the largest organism on Earth, the General Sherman tree, with fire retardant blankets like last week. Okay. Um, Thermohaline circulation overturning. Remember, I keep saying that up here where the water is cold, 
and it's salty because it's been moving along the surface, evaporating, remember? And when it gets up here off Iceland, it goes into free fall into the abyss, and that moves all the ocean water around. Well, when it gets warm up here, then that water isn't so cold anymore. It's not so dense. And when the Greenland ice sheet melts, it makes that water fresh, so the water on the surface isn't as salty. So then it doesn't go into free fall, and that stops the drain. And if you stop the drain, this whole blue and red ribbon thing that redistributes heat around the planet just stops. And it's done it in the past. Like one year it's on and then, then it will just be off. It's now, measurements say it's down about 20%, something like that. And so we don't think this is gonna happen if we limit warming to two degrees, but if it does happen, it's a really big change in the distribution of heat around the planet. And so there would be really major consequences. Probably the worst to suffer would be Europe that is warmed by this tropical water flow. England's latitude is the same as Labrador here. And Labrador, if you go there, is like freaking Arctic. Like, like, like Arctic foxes and polar bears and, and caribou and no trees, all right? No hedgehogs and hobbits, right? So different kind of place. Um, I mentioned this fridge door feedback before um, that as you warm the Arctic, the stuff that's been in the deep freeze, the organic matter climbs into the atmosphere. There's 3,000 to 10,000 gigatons of carbon stored as undecomposed organic matter in soils. So 44 twelfths times that is the amount of CO2 when we're emitting as a species about 50 of those units per year. This is a very large amount of material and has the capacity to be worse than fossil emissions if it got going. Don't want this to get going. Finally, there's methane stored in permafrost as well, places that have gotten waterlogged. The organisms release methane, the ground's frozen so it doesn't get out. But there are all kinds of places you can go in the Arctic where you can like dig a hole and fire it up and it, it'll, it'll burn, keep, make it nice and warm. But that's a problem if it all starts to come out. It's a reactive greenhouse gas. So those are the lecture uh, teaching goals. And I am officially just about a lecture behind, but I'm going to start on the next one because it's a related topic. This is it? No. This way. Okay, so okay, so um, this is also about impacts, but I'm going to focus exclusively on extreme weather now. And it's the extreme weathers that, the weather that has grabbed the public's attention, all right? And so I want to sort of go through what the state of the art is. And the reason this is important is that even five years ago, none of this was possible. Five years ago, Barack Obama said for the last time, or maybe six years ago, you can't attribute any single extreme weather event to climate change. He said that for the last time, because now you can. And so, um, so why did he change his mind? Um, and so I want to talk about the difference between climate versus weather, and then the science of attributing climate change to anthropogenic emissions, how, how we can do that now, and what it means to do that. And later on, which is going to be next time, I'm going to be telling you about, well, what kinds of events can and have been attributed now. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them that have been. And what are the legal implications of that? The thing about something like two degrees of warming is that I can't tell you who's been damaged by that. I can't go out and say, you've been damaged and somebody needs to compensate you. But if my house gets knocked down by extreme rainfall that was caused by fossil emissions, I know I've been damaged. If the science makes the connection, all of a sudden I have a legal claim. And that's why this subject gets so grabby for people, all right? All of a sudden you can identify a specific loss, put a monetary value on it, and have a plaintiff, all right? To say nothing of the fact that when extreme events are happening, you know, the, the, the old story about climate change was it was hard for people to get their head around because it was remote in time and remote in space and blah, blah, blah. 
and people react to things that are immediate emergencies right now affecting them. That's what these extreme weather events do, right? So that's why they're, they're so grabby. Now, about the only thing I'm going to have time for is the direct, correct, and critical difference between climate and weather, all right? Weather should be thought of as random. It follows trends, but it's random. Meaning every time you run the experiment, repeat it, you're gonna get a different answer. Now, for those of you who are like physics people, it's formally chaotic, not random. There's a difference. With, with something that is mathematically chaotic, there's extreme dependence on initial condition. So, so weather's that way. So for instance, if I was trying to predict next month's weather in New York, and I had the perfect physical model, I could do it. And if I ran that model again and again and again, I'd always get the same answer. If it were random, I wouldn't get the same answer. You repeat the experiment, you get a difference. But if I missed in my initial condition, the little air perturbation caused by a butterfly flapping its wings in Beijing, right, right at the start, I would screw up next month's weather forecast because there's this extreme dependence on initial condition. That's the critical difference, right? But from our standpoint, turns out we can't, and you can show this formally, can't tell the difference between that kind of chaotic indeterminacy and randomness. So you should think of this as random. And so it's like rolling a six. You roll a die, you get a six. You roll a die again, you may or may not get a six. It's a random thing. That's the whole basis of gambling. Climate is literally the probabilistic distribution of weather events. So the climate of the weather is that each time you roll the die, if it's an honest die, you, you have an equal probability of getting a one, two, three, four, five, or six. Often, that distribution is summarized by some statistic you can compute from it, like its mean value. And the mean value of a die is gonna be three and a half. Six of the time you get one, six of the time you get two, six of the time you get six, you average those numbers, you're gonna get three and a half, okay? So, so weather is random, and climate is the probability distribution that you draw those random events from, all right? And that's the critical distinction. And so we're going to use that to attribute individual weather, and we're going to use a concept of causality, which is not mechanical. It's not, I pulled out a gun and shot you, and now you're dead, so I'm guilty of murder. It's, I drank to excess, drove down the street, and ran over you. And so now I'm still guilty of manslaughter, but nobody actually knew. Nobody knows how the molecules interacted in my mind. They only know that my probability of hitting you rose by a factor of 20. I might have hit you anyway, okay? But all they know is that I increased the risk. That's embedded in our legal standard, and that's where we're going we're to go, okay? Next time.